Welcome back to the Red Dice Stories RPG podcast with John and Hannah. Hi. And in this episode, we're going to be departing a little bit from the normal format for these monster episodes, since the monster that you guys have chosen on the Twitter poll are the troll variants from the Fiend Folio. Now, we're not going to try and trace these various variants throughout the different editions. We're going to chat about them a little bit, maybe a bit about the troll in popular mythology and see where we go from there. So, love, what does the classic first edition AD&D themed folio say about trolls? So the first thing it says is that trolls are fully detailed in the advanced D&D monster manual. Yeah. And that the ones in here are subspecies that are uh, crossbred with other creatures most of them also from the monster manual so if you want to play along at home and see if you can mm-hmm. guess what species they're they're crossbred with which yeah. it, it is something we see quite often in the older versions of dnd mm-hmm. isn't it you you've either got something that's like tainted with like demonic heritage or it's got like the blood of some other creature and it's just as a way of justifying like having a bit of a variant or putting a bit of extra flavor on the mm-hmm. creature so it then goes on to detail the troll regeneratability Okay. Which is three melee rounds after damage, the troll starts to regenerate. It repairs at three dam- It repairs three hit points per round, and then it goes into quite a bit of detail about it having severed body parts being able to reattach, and the severed body parts being able to fight. Yeah. Even though they're separate from the troll, to kill a troll, the monster must be burned, immersed in acid or any separate pieces treated in the same fashion, or they can regenerate a whole troll again in between 3 to 18 melee rounds. And then it gives you a bit about the subspecies have all inherited this to some degree, and that it's detailed in each creature's specific one. Yeah, and we know that, obviously, as so the, the baseline troll has gone on in various editions in some capacity it's kept that regeneration and the weakness to fire and acid etc as we said at the start though because we're dealing specifically with these variants we're not going to go through the whole history of trolls in the different editions so what sort of um, variants do we get in the fiend folio well the first one is the giant troll do you want to take a look at that okay yep yeah. so it says in here that giant trolls are hideous if you want to have a, if you want to pause this and have a guess now, have a guess now because I'm about to tell you what they crossbred with. Okay, it's a hideous hill giant troll crossbreed, resembling the latter, so it looks like a troll in all but size. They're greatly feared. Their skin is red brown and they have red rimmed eyes. Despite a sort of hot belly to a generally like slovenly appearance, they're very strong and inflict terrible damage, two to sixteen points with their favourite weapon, a large spiked club. They regenerate as trolls, but at a rate of two hit points per melee round, but they can't attach seven limbs. So it's been beefed up in certain areas, but it's not quite as proficient at some things as the baseline troll. However, they've inherited from the hill giants the ability to catch missiles 25% of the time. And if I remember correctly, that comes as part of the whole giants being able to like throw boulders mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Before a giant troll can be killed, at least 10 hit points of damage must be inflicted on it by fire. If this condition is not met and it's reduced to a single hit point, any further damage has no effect save to negate their regeneration. They're found in nearly every climate and they have very acute sense of smell and 90 foot improvision so they can see in the dark. And then next it looks like we've got the giant two-headed troll. So why don't you tell us a bit about that, look? So... I'll give you three guesses what they're crossed with. Unicorns? No, I'm just kidding. We, we, all, we all know it's the Etin. The like, iconic two-headed giant. So they stand at least ten feet tall. They regenerate at trolls, but at a rate of one hit point every melee round, so quite a bit slower. Yeah. Can't rebond severed limbs. They attack two claws, two bites. Both bites are directed at one opponent. They prefer darkness and they get infravision because they're nocturnal. Yeah, that makes sense. And they also get an improved chance against being surprised, so they can only be surprised one in six times. 
and they like to dress like Ettins, which is described as moth-eaten and filthy animal skins. Yeah, so they're, they're pretty much just like normal Ettins, really, with a bit of mm-hmm. like the troll stuff sprinkled on top, like the regen and whatever. Re- regening Ettin, yeah. Yeah, so I was going to say, it seems to me from the pattern of the two we've looked at so far, it seems as though... What they're doing is they're basically taking existing creatures, the giant, the etan, etc. They're putting like a less good version of like the trolls regen on it, because mm-hmm. like obviously these creatures are significantly like harder than a troll anyway. So I wonder if that'll carry on with the next one. So it looks like we've got ice trolls with the next one, and it says they're pretty much the same as um, the normal trolls. Except they have like almost like an icy sort of crystalline body. They're described as being like a little bit weaker than normal trolls. It refers to normal trolls as uh, their stronger cousins. So they have regenerative powers, but only at a rate of two points per round. But it only works in this case as long as the ice troll is in water. So that's an interesting little twist there. And it's a nice little thing. Um, if you can work that out as a player group, you can somehow like, isolate it from water. It's like a sort of secret weakness you can use to sort of n- nullify it. Whereas, obviously, the normal things you do against the troll, you know, fire, acid, etc. If it's in like a cold, watery environment, probably not going to be as easy to set it on fire. So I'm assuming they put that in as like, right, you can't really use fire, but, you know, if you can get it out of the water... That's the weakness. It can attack with two claws for one to eight points of damage. They're unaffected by cold and they can only be hit by magic weapons or missiles. So even though they're described as being a little bit weaker than normal trolls, they're still quite difficult to affect because you can only hit them with magical stuff and they're not affected by cold. However, although we, as we said earlier, fire might be a bit more difficult in this environment, they do take double damage from it. So if you've got like a wizard with fireball or something like that, they're going to be really handy against this bad boy. They've got uh, superior 90-foot improvision and a very acute sense of smell. I can see the next one up's the spirit troll, which is our last variant. Mm-hmm. So why don't you tell us a bit about that, love? I did quite like these ones when I saw them. So... These have been made by the perverted magical interbreeding of trolls and invisible stalkers. And yeah. I'll give you three guesses what the twist on them is. They're invisible? <laughs> Indeed they are. That's going to be a bit of a nightmare first date, isn't it? Otherwise very similar to a troll, slightly shorter. And if you can see invisible things, which I'm sure there's a few low-level spells in D&D that would allow you to, and quite a few sort of medium-level items, probably. Although I don't know how many of them were in this edition. But there's also potentially, depending on how you GM, sort of rules on invisibility. There's other mm-hmm. ways you could like work it out, like looking for footprints. You know, mm-hmm. like, Can you throw some flour in the air? Would mm-hmm. that settle on them? But obviously that depends on how your GM's like handling invisibility in your game. Glitter dust, that's a first edition spell. Yes, it is, that's yeah. specifically for this type of thing. Anyway, uh, it attacks with fangs, claws, uh, against up to three opponents if it so chooses. Damage inflicted by its fangs, 1 to 6, is normal, except that the spirit troll adds its own hit points to the number of hit points damaged inflicted on the victim. That could be pretty nasty. Claws do 1 to 3 hit points each. Uh, It's taken not only from the hit points of the victim, but also from his strength points... No, that's definitely dangerous. Strength points lost in this way are recovered in two to eight turns. If character's strength is reduced to zero, he dies. And if it's reduced to one or two points, he's rendered comatose, only recovering when and if sufficient points are recovered to raise his strength to three or more. Has an acute sense of smell and superior infravision. I don't think it really needs an acute sense of smell on top of everything else. No, no. <laughs> yeah, th- this one's pretty brutal. So, well, I was going to say, I-, I actually, um, 
I, I quite like the fact they've got all these different variants because uh, I've been looking into the, the like the mythology of trolls and obviously it's Scandinavian sort of originally mm -hmm. and sort of way back when like yeah it's a it's a general term referring to just like a monster some sort of primitive mm -hmm. creature that exists outside the bounds of like human society and then as sort of time went on same as we've talked about with like dwarves and gnomes and whatever mm -hmm. it gradually got applied to a more specific type of creature and it was that sort of family of creatures you know that were associated with like the jotun the like the giants and the ogres and stuff like that so i quite like the fact that they've they've sort of gone like oh yeah this is like half giant half troll because it i mean i don't know for certain because obviously i wasn't there when they made the book but to me it's almost like a sort of cheeky wink back at the fact that like when trolls were like first a thing it could mean a giant it could mean an ogre it could mean anything i, I was actually thinking that i've definitely heard sort of folklore stories about ice trolls and about the um invisible trolls effectively yeah creatures that sort of attack you but you can't see them being referred to as trolls yeah i mean i think uh, another good thing about this is uh, we often tell people when they're, like, they're asking for like German advice on like making new monsters and whatever they're like if you just need a quick monster for your game just sort of like, reskin an existing monster so instead of going like oh it's a it's an orc it's a green skinned like human running towards you you go oh it's this like tall thin but like muscular uh, purple skinned creature running towards you or whatever and obviously this is a silly example but if you just by doing that the players aren't immediately going to see this gangly purple skinned muscular figure and be like oh it's an orc but you can use the same stats and there's a there's a bit of a joke in sort of OSR and like D&D circles that like if you want to do like a quick and simple monster you just take the stats for a bear and you just describe it differently because the bear is like a mid-level sort of animal creature that can be quite dangerous but not too dangerous and I've done this a few times myself just take the bear stats describe it as something different and I quite like the fact that what they seem to have done in there is they've done a similar thing where they've just gone like oh I, I want I, I want like something like like an Etin like a two-headed giant but I want it to be a bit different Oh, I just uh, I just take this like worn ability from the uh, from the troll and like dampen it down a little and like slap that on the etin. But otherwise, it's pretty similar. So I suppose you could say if you if you're sort of looking on the downside that maybe they were just trying to fill up a bit of space with these troll variants. But I quite like the fact that not only does it fit in with the sort of like the the mythological sort of idea of how like the troll was invented, but also it sort of fits in with that idea of taking some existing stats just changing them a little bit to make it into a different monster mm -hmm. it also as we were going through made me think very much of the troll hunter movie oh I'm yes pretty yeah. sure that's got a two-headed troll oh yeah a well, giant yeah. troll some trolls in the ice i'm not sure if there's an invisible one in there but the other three definitely are well in the sort of like original sort of scandinavian folklore as it got more sort of codified it was, it was more at first. It was more like a generic term mm -hmm. for like various different creatures. So you could have like giants might be a type of troll. Um, you might have small sort of almost like goblin like things that you'd call a troll. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, again, I, quite, I really like this fact that it's like they're sort of diverging away from like the core troll but it still sort of fits within the sort of mythological idea of it. And I know they took a lot of inspiration from mythology when they were doing it, so I can't believe it's entirely a coincidence. And I think, to be honest, if it is just a cheeky way of them filling up a bit of space, mm -hmm. at least they did it in, like, an entertaining way, you know. Absolutely. So, can you think of any ways to use any of these four? Well, I mean, obviously... Specifically. Obviously, the, the easiest way to use them would be if your player characters have encountered like trolls before and you want to sort of shake things up a little bit you can have them they're exploring a cave lair they see a few signs and they're like oh we know what this is we've fought trolls before we know what we've got to do and then when they go in it's like oh actually you see this like horrible figure with like two heads and that's probably going to set them back a bit or make them reconsider so it's a way of shaking up uh, a type of foe that your players may have encountered a number of times um it's also a way of just giving like a little bit of variety because like, if they've got a lock on like what it takes to kill 
a troll and like as soon as I see one they're like right okay we need to do this this and this get the torches ready get the acid ready get the fire spells ready if you throw something like the ice troll in which you can still use those same tactics but they're not going to work quite as well and there's other tactics that would work better so it may encourage depending on your play group it may encourage your players to like not always approach an encounter that they think is a troll in the same sort of manner because it'll get them to think that like oh there are other types of troll out there there are other creatures out there and i think if you did that with a few monsters in a game hopefully it would lead to players sort of stop assuming that they as soon as they've worked out one creature they instantly know what that, all that creature is going to be like which i think's a good mindset to have in any game because if you get sort of a little bit blase with it and you're like oh here's another ogre it's like the eighth ogre we've killed this week then the game sort of loses a bit of the excitement whereas if you have your players going like oh that looks like a normal troll but remember that last one we fought that like could turn invisible so we best be on our guard it gets people more engaged with the game in my opinion and here was me just going to suggest that you use the ice trolls for like a story with a troll under a bridge. Well, yeah. That was about as much as I'd got to, really. <laughs> what I'd probably recommend people do with looking at trolls, because there are so many folk tales about them, go and pick one and pick it apart and make it your own. Yeah, put it into your game. And I mean, the easiest thing we tend to see with like varying creatures like this, and I've I've seen this in like the old like games workshop games I used to play, where they'll be like, oh yeah, we've got forest trolls, and we've got river trolls, and we've got stone trolls, and stuff like that, and you you define them by the terrain they're in. And if you're doing that, you can just use standard troll stats and just describe them a bit differently. So it's got the same stats, but the river trolls all slimy with like seaweed coming off it and. Eats that smells of rotten fish. The the forest trolls maybe like got a greener sort of coloration to like camouflage itself in, or maybe it has like cracked skin that looks a bit like bark. And that's all just with the descriptions. So terrain's one thing you can do with it. But as we've seen from the fiend folio, if you want, you can also selectively sort of borrow bits of stats from other creatures that you can then describe as like being part troll effectively. Mm -hmm. And you can you can tailor them to suit whatever particular niche you have in your game. So that's been our episode on the variant trolls from the AD and D first edition Fiend Folio. We hope you've found it enjoyable. If you'd like to get in touch with us, tell us how you use trolls in your game, or maybe you'd like to make some suggestions for future creatures we should cover, then you can get in touch with us either by leaving a voicemail on Speakpipe. There's a link in the description of the episode of this show, or you can send us an email to rdrpgpodcast at gmail.com. We'll be putting up our next Twitter poll to determine what monster we're going to look at in the next episode very shortly, so check out Red Dice Diaries on Twitter for that. Until we see you next time, take care, stay safe, and keep gaming. Bye.